Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our August 11th uh, Grace Toronto service. Um, just wanted to welcome everyone here, especially a special welcome to the friends of, and family of Harper um, who have come for her baptism this morning. Over the past week, uh, I've been watching the Olympics, um, maybe uh, much like you as well, and one thing um, that I've observed um, about myself is that I am filled with emotion, uh, filled with tremendous emotion um, when I see the way the athletes are cheered on and how they are supported. Uh, there is a sense of joy and excitement that you feel um, as they enter into the stadium. And uh, you sense, you know, you get a feeling uh, for these athletes for the countless hours that they have trained, uh, being the best at what they do. And as I'm watching the crowd, uh, they seem to have this boundless energy, waving flags, uh, screaming, um, you know, jumping up and down even. And as we see them try to cheer on uh, these athletes and give their encouragement and support, uh, one thing I think about from looking at the audience and from the crowd, it's, it's a reminder that sometimes that we are cheering on something even greater. Uh, we, it is a reminder that there is an eternal celebration that awaits us in heaven. One that doesn't cheer on ourselves, but gives glory to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ himself. See, we are created to give praise, not to ourselves, but to a creator. Scripture tells us that our greatest fulfillment comes when we worship the true God with our thoughts and deeds and with our lips. Imagine the joy and gladness we receive when we stand before God one day when we get to praise him forever. And so this morning as we reflect on the way we celebrate here on earth, let that be a reminder of the glimpse of what we can do in heaven. Let us come before God with hearts of gratitude and praise, knowing that our worship is a foretaste of our heavenly celebration that is to come. Grace Toronto, will you stand right now and join me as we read our call to worship from Psalm 115. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. Let us do that right now, Grace Toronto. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord.
to face the day In your presence all our fears are washed away Washed away
join us one more time as we sing the doxology, okay? seated. As we continue in our service, let us remind ourselves of this beautiful imagery that we just saw of baptism and how it serves as a way to help us see the covenant promise that God has given us as his people. Baptism reminds us of the sin that stains us and prevents us from approaching a holy God. But you see, we can be thankful that through the work of Christ on the cross, he gave us something we don't deserve, which is his righteousness. His righteousness so that all who believe in him may receive this righteousness instead of the sins in which we own. Grace Toronto, every Sunday we have an opportunity to come clean before God. And what a privilege it is. See, our prayer of confession is an appeal. It is an appeal to God for his grace and reminds us that no matter where we are in our journey of faith, whether this morning you are exploring the faith or you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ, that we all carry burdens throughout our weeks and we don't measure up to God's standard of holiness. We can go to an almighty God who responds to us with his grace and mercy in our private prayers and in our corporate prayers. This morning, will you join with me as we pray our corporate prayer of confession? Eternal and merciful God, you have loved us with a love beyond our understanding, and you have set us on paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yet we have strayed from your way. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed through what we have done and what we have left undone. As we remember the lavish gift of your grace, symbolized in baptism, O God, we praise you and give you thanks that you forgive us yet again. Grant us now, we pray, the grace to die daily to sin and to rise daily to new life in Christ, who lives and reigns with you, and in whose strong name we pray, amen. We now have an opportunity for you to make these prayers private and for you to have an opportunity to come before God. Whatever burdens that you are carrying this morning, God wants to hear from you and he encourages you to bring these before him. So let us take a moment to do that now. We come before you and we thank you that we have someone to mediate for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who gives us new life when we, not when we believe in him, but he also takes away our sins. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The words of God himself tells us that we don't have to spiritually stay where we are but that in his grace and mercy, he gives us another path, one that is filled with hope and joy. When we put our trust and faith in him, we become God's children and receive new life. So now hear these words from Psalm 103. It says here, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Amen. 
Grace Toronto, will you stand if you're able as we give thanks and worship for God, for who He is. Everyone, please join with me as we pray for the church and the city. God, you are sovereign over us, over this church and over this city. You are Lord over this nation. You are the hope to the hopeless, and you are the peace to the restless. You are our almighty, infinite Father. You give the healing and grace that our hearts always hunger for. You are the Almighty Counselor. 
comforter and keeper who is like you, God. We thank you that you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into your marvelous, marvelous light. You have called us here this morning to worship you and hear your word. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you as one body this morning. We thank you that our church is growing, that you are bringing a lot of new people to the church and leading them to know you more. We also thank you that more people are coming back to the faith and more kids are getting to experience Christ every week. God, we thank you for the growing opportunities to serve one another. You have given us time and resources. We ask for wisdom and understanding in how we can steward it well. We ask that you would mold us and mature us into your image in order to serve one another well and build each other up. There is good work ahead of us. Lord, grant us endurance and encouragement to persevere and live in one accord because it is you who works in us both to will and to work for your good pleasure. As we serve one another, God, we ask that you would call, confirm, and choose the best women's ministry director during this season. We pray and acknowledge that it is the wisdom of your sovereign will that determines the outcome of the leadership team. We also submit to you the plans and decisions for our pastors, staff, administrators, small group leaders, and ministry volunteers throughout the summer and into the fall. Equip them by the power of the Holy Spirit as they discern the next steps for the church. God, help us now to live a life that is dependent on your grace. Keep our heart and guard our souls from the evils that we will face. Help us to put on the shield of faith beyond these walls and into our daily lives as we navigate our vacation time, projects, relationships with friends, families, classmates, and co-workers. Apart from you, God, we can do nothing. Yet your spirit has given us life and opened your word to us. You have written your word in our hearts through the gospel of your son, and you have given us endless hope and peace. Your word says that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so we submit to you all things and for this service this morning. In Jesus' name, this we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, for leading us in that time of prayer. As we continue in our worship service, we take a pause now to remind ourselves of the tithes and offerings that we give back to our uh, God through the giving of his church. Uh, the offering that our church receives uh, allows us to run many of the ministries and programming that you see throughout the week, and it is used to benefit all our spiritual walks. So I encourage you to take a look at the offering website uh, to learn about the many ways in which you can give. And if you're new this morning, uh, there's no obligation for you to give. Uh, your presence is enough is a gift to us. Uh, and as we move now to our community life announcements, um, we have got lots uh, taking place over the next three weeks. Uh, you can see that on the screen behind me or, on, on, or online. Um, I believe the, one of the events has passed already. We had a great time. Uh, some of the men came together for our basketball yesterday and we had lunch afterwards. Um, but we've got other events as well. I, I hear that summer eats are continuing. Um, so if you're looking for a place to uh, have lunch with, uh, a group of people, uh, just you know, go to the lobby. You'll see someone with a sign, and uh, they would love to take you out for lunch. Uh, you have to pay, of course, uh, your, your own self, but they would love to take you to where they're going to have lunch. So, um, And if you're new this morning uh, as well, um, come to the welcome desk. We've got uh, lots of people in the lobby. Um, there's a little welcome desk there, and they would love to uh, hear more about your story and uh, welcome you to our church. Uh, we'll now go to our greeting time, and if you're looking for something, uh, typically in our service, uh, we turn around and we greet each other. Uh, if you're looking for something to uh, talk about this morning, uh, as the Summer Olympics are coming to a close, um, share with someone, uh, your neighbor, what your favorite uh, Olympic event has been. And uh, GT Kids are dismissed, and we'll be back in two minutes.
Well, good morning. Shh. Good morning. Happy August. It's nice to see all of you. We are uh, hoping you are enjoying your summer as we are enjoying ours. Uh, we are in the midst of a small series on the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. And today we get to hear what God has to say to the church at Sardis. And here to help us with that reading is Kathy. So today's reading comes from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. To the church in Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of the person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be back. I want to thank the elders for giving me some weeks off. It has been very great. We're looking at the letters to the churches in Revelation, and if you have been with us for several weeks, if you are new, we're glad you're here. Thank you. If you've been with us for a few weeks, though, you're beginning to see some patterns emerge and some repetitive sounds happening. Revelation is a book which reveals. It reveals what is going on in the spiritual dimension of life while we are experiencing in the material and physical world of history events as they unfold. It reveals the history and the destiny of the church and of all humanity. It tells us that Jesus is reigning, that all of history is coming to a consummation based not on arbitrary chance or the collision of atoms, but by the architecting, authoring, curating, and providential ordering of a sovereign God Himself. Though sometimes hard to interpret, this book is profound with insights into what is really real. Finally, it reveals Jesus in a way some of us are not used to. We're used to the Jesus of the Gospels, the suffering, serving, healing, meek and mild Jesus, who is silent when accused, goes to a cross and breathes his last life as a servant of all. That Jesus is this Jesus, but this Jesus feels a little different, because this is the reigning Jesus. This is the commander-in-chief of the people of God, the king of the cosmos, seated and enthroned at the right hand of God. He judges the living and the dead, and He is here judging the church with, well, some rather strong words. It's the Olympics. We just won the 4 by 100 and everyone is talking about the difference in language between an American sprinter and ours. And we're so self-satisfied that Mr. DeGrasse has been so gracious in victory over a vanquished foe who was rather brash, rather, uh, we might say, American. Look at this text and let me ask you, does the Jesus of these words sound to you diplomatic and Canadian? He sounds rather south of the border for us, doesn't he? Because he is and because we need it. Strong words are needed for a church that's constantly wandering. So, because this text is very similar to another text, I want to take a moment and let you think about the whole of the letters as we begin to see some patterns. The first thing I want you to see is that there are seven letters. Seven is the biblical number that symbolizes completeness. 
This is not seven arbitrary churches. Jesus has chosen these seven because they really exist, but they as a group symbolize the whole of the church throughout history, from the time of His resurrection to the time of His coming again. The particular order of these churches and the main imperative given to each of the churches, again, reveals a pattern. If you read them all in sequence, you'll see Ephesus is the first church. The main imperative is repent. To Smyrna, the next one, hold fast. To Pergamum, repent. To Thyatira last week, hold fast. Repent, hold fast, repent, hold… What do you think this week is? Repent. Although also the word hold fast is there. Next week, hold fast. Laodicea, (laughs) repent. What are we to make of this pattern? It's simple. Men and women, from the rising of Jesus and His ascension to heaven to the coming back of Jesus and His creation of the new heavens and the new earth, these two guardrails will frame the life of this church and the church of God and every church for all of history. We are called at all times to hold fast and to repent to repent and to hold fast. Now, how do they differ? These churches are called to repent of different things and hold fast about different things. That is true. There is a variety here. Ephesians, you've lost your first love. Oh, you, you permitted false teachers. You allowed sexual immorality. This group here, you've fallen asleep spiritually. What does this mean? Implications for us as a church. First of all, have a little grace on other churches and the church throughout history. Different churches will be strong at different things at different times. People say we're strong at worship. They think we're strong at teaching and community at different times. Wait a couple of decades. We will change. We won't be as strong at X, but we might be stronger at A. Churches that right now we say, well, we're better than you at… Who cares? Wait a decade. They'll be better at us at that. Let's have a little ironic grace toward the churches we know and the church that we inhabit. Secondly, not all these problems will happen at the same time, so be watchful. A problem that we may not be dealing with now, we will deal with. That happened to us during COVID. Problems that we're dealing with now may not be problems in the past. Be humble, be gracious, and be watchful. This is the church. All right. Let's look at this particular church, the church at Sardis. Sardis was a city that is now Turkey. Sardis was a very prominent city at some points in its past history, quite prominent in some of the previous empires, but by the time of the Roman Empire, it had fallen into a shell of its former self. As this book was being written, Revelation, there was a resurgence, a renewal of Sardis. It was beginning to get financial, economic, trade, and cultural life again. The church, in the words of Jesus, had lost its prominence. It's a picture of the city. It had once been very alive. It had probably been a flagship church in Asia Minor, and it had fallen into this sort of dusty, worldly, lack of passion. It had left its first love, scholars think. It had lost its salt in the words of Jesus. And so his demand here is wake up, repent, and hold fast. So we're going to look at two questions here that seem to be at the center of this church. One, what is it sleeping on? And what are we sleeping on? And two, how do we wake up? What are we sleeping on? How do we wake up? Here he says, We have some clues as to what we're sleeping on from the beginning. 
The angel of the church in Sardis writes to him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's Jesus. And he's giving the seven spirits of God. That's probably symbolic language for the Holy Spirit distributed to all the churches as if He is their own Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' Spirit, and He sent it to the seven stars. That's probably the churches themselves. This is very similar language to the language of Ephesus when He said, Him who holds the seven stars in His right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Very evocative language. It seems that He is saying, I see you. I know you. And what does He know? He says, your works are incomplete. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Clue number two, there's something that they have not completed, and it seems to have deadened them. This is the language of a journey not quite complete. This is the language of someone starting well but getting off track. The language here is used of the church and of individual people called to live a life of holiness and love and purity, servanthood, but as they've matured, they've lost something. They've broken into patterns of selfishness and compromise with the world. There's another clue. He says, there are some of you who have not soiled your clothes. Implication, most of you have. What does it mean to have your uh, clothes soiled? It means that a foreign substance, not native to your clothes, which in this case were white, which symbolizes purity, something foreign has gotten onto the purity of your clothes, some foreign substance from the environment around it. Clearly, the meaning is this. The world around you, the city around you, the culture you swim in has polluted you. This is the language of a church stained with the thinking, the values, the conduct, the worldview of the culture they inhabit, not of the gospel. A church that has lost its salt and light instead has let the salt of the culture change it. Now, the language of this letter is very telling. Many scholars think that they have bought into the sexual permissiveness that a lot of the other churches are accused of, but this language is more vague. It just says they've been stained with the clothing. It may be sexual permissiveness, but the language permits a wider understanding. And let me tell you why I think this is valuable for us to hear, because it isn't just all about sex. It's about a whole way of seeing and viewing the world, men and women, thinking about who you are, what you love, and God, and what He loves. The world is a tempting place. It tempts you with money, power, pleasure, comfort, significance, and a host of other things. All of these things, in their rightful place, are good things. All of these things wrongly invested in are corrupting, distorting, addicting, and cancerous things. Ask any therapist worth their money, and they will say it is so. And I have seen the world sneak its way into me because the world doesn't stand still and it doesn't take no for an answer easily. It'll keep coming around and again and again. Oh, I offer you sexual pleasure. You don't want sexual pleasure? Okay, that's not your jam. I'll offer you money. I'll offer you your resume. Oh, you don't. I'll offer you respect. Oh, you're not into that? I'll offer you a chance to make a difference. Whatever your longing is, the world offers to sell it to you, and all you have to give it is yourself. And the world sneaks and weasels its way into you. Let me offer you cultural sophistication. You just have to adopt a few of our values. When I was younger, I was a single man in university, and I had become a Christian, and I was pretty sure I knew what was wrong with me. I had had to get, I had to deal with lust, I had to deal with greed. Those Two things happened to be rampant in my law school at the time, so I went after them. I went to war with them. I focused on them, and I made substantial progress. And in the meantime, pride at my progress had snuck into me. 
and I was a proud, cocky young leader. And so then I started to deal with my pride. And so then I started to get busy and I tried to serve people and help people. And as I was starting to get some handle on my pride, productivity had grown its roots into me and I had an idol of being respected through my productivity. The world's a sneaky place. The world will offer you and come at you from just about every angle. And so what he says here is, wake up. The Greek word really is, resume watchfulness. Watch over your soul. I've seen the challenges to me change. I've seen challenges to the church change. When I was a new Christian, the church was being assaulted by the view that if you didn't believe in evolution, you couldn't be a thinking person, and therefore Christianity was discredited. In the 30-plus years since I became a Christian, unbelievable amounts of cosmological evidence, um, scientific evidence for a creator have grown up. But the challenges to the church are different. While we were defending that, sexual ethics completely changed. Now that we're laser focused on sexual ethics, we've decided that we are going to, we are going to counter and engage the, the world on its sexual ethics. But in the meantime, we created a culture in the church where we have celebrity pastors doing the work for us. We're fighting a culture war, but we're adopting the culture's means of putting people on a pedestal and not holding them accountable. See, the world is sneaky. You need to keep watch. Watch over your soul where are you sleeping? What are you sleeping on as individuals? What secret longings are you nurturing that you know can grow to poison you? What secret fears are you harboring that if you don't deal with those fears, they can distort you and they can break you? I found out years later that my fear, my productivity idol was fueled by a fear, a fear of humiliation that came from my family of origin. And it was in my very late 50s that counseling brought out that fear underlay that idol. There are things that you fear. Could be from your family of origin, could be from anything. There are things that you nurture. Don't sleep on them. Wake up and be watchful over them. And we as a church, what are we sleeping on? What parts of the culture are infecting us? In the past, it is for a while we thought we were the hipster church. That went nowhere. We thought we were the put together of the church. That was a complete and utter lie. Just before COVID, we were flirting with being the culturally sophisticated church. In the past 20 years, almost all churches have struggled to hold on to the belief that people need Jesus or they are destined for an eternal judgment without Him. And we're losing our boldness, although that seems to be maybe turning around. What are you sleeping on? What are we sleeping on? Wake up. Resume your watchfulness. Secondly, how do we wake up? It says here, remember and repent. It says, remember then what you've received and heard. Keep it or hold fast to it and repent. Remember what you received and heard. The language of, of, of waking up is the language historically the church has used for what we call revival. It is the language of churches that have fallen dull in their spiritual sensitivity to God. Churches that have grown cool in their love for God. Churches that have grown warm toward the world around them and insensitive to the dangers that face them. If you know anything about revivals in history, they are, church historians tell us, usually marked by two things. Firstly, a remembering and recovering of the centrality of the gospel. Secondly, a repenting from and awakening to Areas where the culture and the city and the world have made them dull in their walk with God. And that is exactly what John is, Jesus through John is telling us here. Firstly, remember what you received and heard. What did they receive and what did they hear? It was the gospel. 
It was Jesus crucified that had been proclaimed to them. They heard about God's Son coming down to earth, giving His life to pay the penalty for our sin. They heard that everything they'd ever done, everything that they were ashamed about, everything that you feel guilty about, you should feel shame over and you should feel guilt over, but it has been paid for by the one who had no shame, no guilt, and sin. Jesus Christ hanging on a cross for you. These people heard what we should be hearing about, that God unconditionally, out of sheer love for you, sent His Son, who out of sheer love for you, lived as a human and taught us about Himself and then died on a cross for you and me. The truest way to break a hardened heart is to smash it with blood. The blood of God the Son come down to earth to save you, His beloved one. Stop and look at that man, silent before his accusers. Can you see him? Because he wants you with him in paradise. He wants you to be forgiven of everything evil and wrong and distorted because he loves you. Look at him, will you? Close your eyes if you need to, but look at him spit upon, having thorns drilled into his head until the blood starts to pour down his forehead and the side of his face. Look at him as he looks at you. And all you see is love and unfathomable compassion through the pain you pity him, but you see he pities you because he sees you in your sin and he longs to deliver it from you. Look at him nailed to a cross, hearing his rasping breath as he tries to breathe and pulls himself up, ripping his wrists and his ankles so that he can breathe one more breath. Do you hear him rasping out? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Do you hear him in his final breath? Do you hear him saying, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me as he bears the judgment of your sin? And do you see him and hear him? As he says at the end, it is finished. Your sin has been paid by his blood and his life. See him, look at him, hear him, feel his love, and the dust will leave your soul. See Him as He is, as He was, as He will be, and your soul will leap for joy. And all that toil and self-examination and self-improvement and trying to forsake your sin will all be crystallized and made easy because the love for sin will be dissolved in the blood and love that the Lamb has poured out and the Spirit is pouring in to your soul and your mind and your joy. The way out of sleep is to remember what you received and heard. The way out of sleep, secondly, is to repent. How do you repent? By continually rehearsing and remembering as we've just described. Allow your heart to be melted by the constant meditation on the glory, the humidity, the humility, the freeness, the compassionate nature of the grace that Jesus has for you. How undeserved it is, how unconditional it is, how unbelievable it is. Rehearse the gospel to yourself. Secondly, determine to obey the Lord Jesus. Decide to fear Him above all things. Decide in your mind to help cultivate your heart, to care for what He cares for, to desire what He desires more than your own sinful and selfish longings and lusts. Learn to submit your feelings with the help of your thinking so that your doing honors Him. The older generation called it self-denial. The newer generation calls it reordering your desires. My counselor called it aligning your thoughts, your heart, 
and your actions to one thing. The Bible calls it obedience. It is yours. Take it. Finally, find your own pathway to spiritual intimacy. Some of you are highly relational. Some of you love people, and people fill you with the joy of Jesus. There are certain people in my life that I cannot get enough of. Why? Because when I see them, I just see Jesus, and being around them brings me joy. There are several couples like that in this room today, and I want to say thank you to them. You make me feel Jesus' love. Some of you are not quite as relational. Some of you are more intellectual. You'll go read somebody, John Owen or Jonathan Edwards or somebody really brilliantly profound, and it will, it will feed your soul. Some of you, you put on worship, and the music makes your heart sing to God. Find that pathway and start regularly as a rhythm using that pathway that God has made in you to bring you close to Him regularly. Because, men and women, obedience is not an option. Works do not earn God's approval. Works show you have received the gift of His approval. I tell people all the time when I'm talking to people who aren't Christian that salvation is a little like this. None of us can swim to Hawaii, even from the Vancouver coast, but Jesus buys a plane ticket for us to fly to Hawaii. It's perfectly free. free. We just have to believe that He bought the ticket and get on the plane. But when we land, Passport control is going to say, do you belong here? Your faith in what Jesus has done is enough to earn God's, uh, to, to get God's pleasure. Jesus has earned it. You receive it as a gift. But your passport, which shows you're His, is that His Spirit has come into you, and you begin to obey Him from the freeness of your heart. Obedience does not merit God's approval, but it proves you are His child. So I say to you, Grace Toronto, to the extent that we are following Jesus, let us hold fast. But to the extent that we are asleep, we need to ask ourselves, what are we sleeping on? And how do we wake up? Remember and repent. Let's pray. Father, I thank You and praise You for Your goodness and for Your grace. I pray that whatever we're sleeping on, we would wake up. I don't think we as a church are like this church, but there are areas now and there will always be areas that we are sleeping on. Help us as individuals and help us as the church and help us as leaders to remember You, to fall in love with You, and to allow Your love to empower us to repent and do the things which please you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We have time for a couple of questions. I have but one. <clears throat> How do you deal with fear from your family of origin? You can't change your family. You're correct. You can only change you. If your family of origin is deeply broken, you will probably require, you will probably require some skilled healers to help you. It took me 58 years to figure out that I needed a trained counselor to help me see the areas of distortion that my family of origin had. However, every therapist I know will tell you it is not they who change you. They just help you diagnose. They help prescribe. But it's you in cooperation with the Holy Spirit who must change your way of thinking and interpreting. So if your family hurts you, you have the power by the way you think by the way you feel, by the way you interpret what is happening. You have the power not to let it distort you in the same way. It may take 
some skilled healing and skilled healers to help you. But but with God's help, His church's help, and the Spirit's help, you, you can be free. Grace Toronto, it is time for us to wake up to what we're sleeping on. Take a moment now as I invite the band to come up, and I want you to think, what is it that I'm sleeping on? What do I need to give to God in confession? How do I need to change? What part of Jesus' love for me is not capturing my soul? Take a moment and reflect as we go to prayer. Father, we often think of repentance as a sorrowful task, and very often it is. But there is a joy in true repentance because true repentance is seeing you as more lovely than any other competing counterfeit God and seeing you as more lovely and being filled with the joy of your love is a most freeing, most beautiful, most joyful thing. So help us to repent with sober hearts, but also joyful ones. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We have a song of response now. I ask you to rise as we sing together.
Jesus now invites all baptized believers who have put their faith in him to a meal of grace where they can gaze upon him in all of his scandalous, beautiful, servant, dying love for us. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. Let us eat the bread together. A few moments later, Jesus held up a cup of wine. It was, scholars think, the third cup in the Passover liturgy of Passover meals of the day was the cup of redemption. And he held up the cup. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins in my blood. And he said to them what he says to you and me, do this, drink this grace in remembrance of me. Well, we are nearing the end of our service. At the end of our service, we are going to have um, a benediction, after which people will be here, elders and our prayer team will be down here for prayer. There are many of you that need to repent, remember, get right with God. We want to help you with that, so come. Jesus says to anyone, wherever you are, you are always invited to come. Come with your burdens. Come with your shame. Come with your guilt. It can be washed away. And if you are a Christian, it is washed. But let me assure you of it. So we will be here ministering as you come. But we also will have, for those of you who choose coffee over prayer, We'll have coffee. <laughs> did you like the way I did that? That was clever, wasn't it? We'll have coffee, uh, probably outside, possibly in this room, depending on, on the weather. But we ask you now to stand for our benediction. From 2 Corinthians. May Almighty God, who caused light to shine out of darkness, shine in our hearts cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Go in his love. Experience deeply anew his grace. Spread his joy. We're done, everyone. Enjoy. There's light for a look at the sea.
bueno, 